Hey everybody and welcome to DBS Films Podcast. My name is Kellen and with me as always is my brother Brendan and together we make movies with DBS Films. Today we are going to be talking about The Girl in Cabin 13, specifically the post-production. This is the third episode so if you listen to this one be sure to take a look at the first two and you can take a look at The Girl in Cabin 13 online right now. It is free on Tubi. Now, The Girl in Cabin 13 was our ninth feature film. It was the first movie after what we lovingly call The Hateful Eight, which is basically, you know, a real learning process for us. We had a, a real shift in the mindset when it came to, you know, how we're going to go ahead and um, proceed in making these. So we're really going to highlight how that model changed, you know, from all of it and also in the post-production. But last before, you know, we do, we want to mention our community as always. We have super fans that are absolutely amazing. So be sure to take a look online, join our Discord channel for a lot of fun. We have Trivia Night, Movie Mondays, and really just a cool community is, is blossoming there. So make sure you check it out if you think this is pretty cool. So do you think, you know, stemming from the pre or post-production, all of the things we learned from the past movies, that it actually completely changed the entire process for The Girl in Cabin 13? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what we talk about all the time, which is I think if you're an independent filmmaker, you should be or have a heavy process or a heavy involvement in the editing process of your movie. Because the editing, I think, is the most important process of this whole filmmaking um you know, going from script to a uh, final upload, I think editing is the most important process. And I think when you learn how to edit properly, you're understanding how to edit properly, all that information, that feedback in your editor mind starts to work and it can come back to when you're actually filming the movie to make sure that everything edits together properly. And then it goes back to screenwriting. When you're writing a script, you're making sure that everything you're writing is actually filmable and you can actually edit it. So when you have, and you're working in a editor's mindset, it's gonna make everything so much easier. And I think this was the big transition for us in the learning period for us to just really realize how important editing is and not having to work with somebody else that we're doing it ourselves. And the feedback that you know we're learning um, on the flies with editing can be brought back and just consolidate and clean up the filmmaking process because I was a DP on this one. So already when I'm shooting things, I'm trying to figure out, does this cut together? You know, how do I enter this scene and how do I exit the scene, which I think is a big problem with a lot of filmmakers. They just don't know how to start a scene and how to get out of a scene to make it flow properly. And then going back to the screenwriting phase, I'm making sure that I'm not writing anything that's going to be difficult to edit or difficult to shoot. So, you know, Having an editor's mindset and then looking back at all three phases of the filmmaking process um, and just our general mindset of keeping things minimalistic and keeping things, you know, as easy as possible. I think the girl in cabin 13 was just a turning point for us to really realize that, you know, being minimalistic filmmakers, this is how we need to proceed. And just you always want to have an emphasis on the editor's mindset so that, you're always thinking all the way through the process before you even start the process in the screenwriting phase. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's super critical. And I like the idea that, you know, calling it the editor's mindset, just in the sense that that is the person that you need to really understand. Because again, the biggest the biggest goal for any kind of process is to have a finished upload simply because the amount of experience you get from getting across the finish line, even if your movie is 99%, if it's not uploaded, it's still not quite there because you really need to get feedback and you need to understand, you know, it's not just saying, Hey, I completed it. It's, it's understanding, you know, what does this do good for? It's building a community for you as a filmmaker. There's all of these benefits that come out from having a finished product. Not to mention just the mental, you know, benefit of being done with something, you know, feeling like, hey, I finally got this released. You know, I, I hear stories of indie movies and shorts just weighing on the directors for many, many years. And I'm sure there's cases where it happens their entire life because things get lost into that void. And the reason for it is because they don't have the editor's mindset of what do I need to make the final product? And that's the mindset that the editor has, you know, as a writer, you're telling a good story as a cinematographer, you're really trying to kind of, you know, make it look a certain way as an editor, you're trying to get that finished product uploaded. And 
you know, because we went through what we did in our past movies in this editing process, we understood more so of, you know, the best way to never learn, uh, you know, to, to do something or learn the quickest is if you touch the stove and it's hot, if you end up getting footage that you can't put together, it ends up lasting, you know, with you in the sense of, we're not going to let this happen again. We're not going to find ourselves in these situations. And because of that, it, you know, as you mentioned, led to a change in this process. So, you know, I, I think one thing that ends up happening, like, you know, super quickly in any kind of like indie film or any kind of indie development is they simply look at trying to, you know, get across the finish line when they don't really have a plan for it. Whereas what we have now is from the, basically the end of the finish line, we've worked it all the way back from that post-production process. So that in itself really makes the biggest difference to me now is while it was very painful in some of the past movies, the girl in cabin 13 overall was a really smooth and clean, you know, post-production. So do you want to kind of talk about the difference in, how it benefits you moving forward with the editor's mindset and how quickly it can get you through a post-production process in comparison. Yeah, because I, you know, the script is written with the editor's mindset in place. So I knew how, when I wanted to insert B-roll, when I wanted to have extreme close-ups, you know, how I was going to do montages. I knew this whole thing going into it. And obviously this is the first one where I DP. So I didn't necessarily know if it was going to turn out like I had it in my head and it did. Um, so this was the first one where what I had in my head when I was writing the screenplay, it actually turned out like I had it, you know, in my head when we did the final upload. Now were there small variations and obviously in my head is going to be better than the final upload just because we had a compromise, but for the most part, this movie, and especially the climax was how I envisioned it. And, so when you have that ability to envision things and take the story that you have in your head and actually film it and shoot it, then going to the editing table, it just comes down to, all right, which takes are the best? Um, which ones do we get like a more genuine performance from? And then there's some natural organic stuff as you're editing that you can, you know, make some changes that are better that make the film just better or, or, or you know, pace better. So there's some organic uh, creativity that happens, but for the most part, it was, you know, this is how it's going to lay out, you know, on the timeline. And this is what we're going to choose. Now it's just figuring out what footage works out, um, you know, it, to make the film the best that it possibly can be. And Girl in Cabin 13 is a very simple film. There's only two actors. So it's usually just over the shoulder, over the shoulder wide. And then we just kind of move on. And then the climax is pretty much, Chloe running through the woods with some, you know, masked men trying to attack her. So editing wise, it is actually very, very easy to easy movie to edit. There wasn't a lot of hard stuff in there. The audio that we got was great. There was like a little issue with Joe um, and his lav mic. He was just wearing the headphones. So the headphones were hitting the lav mic. No, and I was super worried about this. Um, I did a lot of work on it to try and remove the mic bumps nobody brought it up. No one brought it up at all. We listened to it in a theater for the premiere and the festival wins that we got never an issue. So, you know, the footage that we got was great. It edited smoothly together. There wasn't any big issues. There's no big pickups. I think the only pickup we had was when um, Carl was breaking through the window, which was just me getting um, essentially bulletproof glass from home Depot and having Dylan smash it. Um, so there wasn't any big time pickup issues and it was just smooth and it was a, a much easier movie to edit than the murder house, which we're about to complete just because the murder house had four characters and had a lot of technical scenes. There were no big technical scenes in this movie because once again, we just wanted to keep it as simplistic as possible. And this is my biggest recommendation to new filmmakers is keep it simple adopt a minimalistic shooting style. There is no shame in making a very simple movie in screenwriting and filming and editing this is like this is a, the perfect beginner movie 
for anyone that's getting into filmmaking because you can start with this and then slowly add to it, slowly add to it, slowly add to it and build yourself up as opposed to starting with something like The Invited with a giant cast, crazy characters and just a ton of technical shots because to edit that thing was just an absolute nightmare. So, you know, my advice would be just find something that you can, just, you know, that flows very quickly, is very well paced and is very, very simple. If this is your first or second film. I, I completely agree. You know, I'm, I'm really a big fan of keeping it, you know, simple, but serious in the sense that you have a very, you know, methodical approach to it because you have to understand that this is you just growing your base you know growing whatever your baseline is and then taking more ambitious steps when it comes to the writing as you mentioned you know the haunting the murder house is just a little bit more ambitious because of what we're able to prove we're able to go ahead and take those leaps same thing for the shapeshifter um but you know that's something i really want to highlight uh as the reason we stress the you know editing mindset so much and i think now is a perfect time for it with this episode because again that process of the girl in cabin like making my way through the roughs doing the first roughs like all of these stuff you know it was so easy to put together um it cut very cleanly and the biggest thing is like when your basic storyline is intact like that then you know like you said you get deeper takes and you get to play around with it more and more Whereas it almost felt like, you know, all of the, the past movies, to some degrees, there was so many technical issues or things like that, that basically caused us to not even have the footage we needed. And we had to basically use what we could get. So, you know, I want you to kind of highlight how we had more equipment, more crew and essentially more issues. And then now we had a very simple process. We kept it very basic. We understood what we could do. And we had essentially no major issues. And why adding more variables to a set is oftentimes going to hurt you more so than help you, even if you got a bigger budget for it. Well, I think what you said just now, which is understanding what you're able to do is the big takeaway from this. When you're an editor's mindset and you have filmed the movie before, you understand, all right, this shot is possible. And this shot is actually going to go into the movie and it's going to cut cleanly. If you've done it before, you could fall back on it again. And it just comes back to my whole philosophy on filmmaking is you just have to know when things don't work and just avoid them, avoid the pitfalls of making filmmaker of independent filmmaking and just avoid those things. And the only way you can do that is by making a lot of film and uploading the film. So I'm really falling back on shots that I've done before that I know cut well and that I can lean back on to make these productions. The shapeshifter, almost 95% of that film was shots that we've done before with maybe 5% new stuff, but I was very confident in the 5% new stuff because we did it in pre-production or we tried it out um, in another way. And I think a lot of independent filmmakers just don't understand where they are at on the, the level of um, just technical research as well as, um, you know, on a skill level. So they're trying to do these shots that they've watched in Hollywood and it's just not possible as an independent filmmaker. So you're already doing a lot of stuff that isn't possible, um, you know, for you as an independent filmmaker. And it's just not going to edit together properly because it's just, it's not, you're, it's going to be out of focus or there's going to be an issue with these shots so I think understanding what you're capable of and what you can actually accomplish is like the first step of this whole process. Just making sure that, you know, the bare minimum, you're getting basic coverage. So it's a wide, two close-ups, over the shoulder, over the shoulder, and then get out of that scene. Bare minimum. Start with that. Then you can start doing, I would recommend like close-up inserts. So it's like, how do you get into the scene? How do you get out of the scene? Usually we get into a scene with a hard cut of some sort, like whether it's opening a beer, opening wine, um, some kind of noise action that you can cut onto. Get out of scenes with like a lingering longer shot or a reaction shot, or you can close it out with like a laptop shutting. And once again, you can cut on something that has noise to it. But just all this comes from being an editor, understanding the editing process. And trust me, like, even if you just get a basic understanding of this stuff to relay this information to your DP and to keep this information um, in the back of your head when you're writing a screenplay is going to make this whole process flow much, much easier 
because I really think the hardest part of this whole process for an independent filmmaker is editing because that's where the rubber meets the road and you really have to figure out, all right, is this take good? You know, is there technical issues with this take? Um, and then you start to get feedback from everyone. It can be very, very overwhelming. And this is why I think a lot of indie films are just lost to the void because you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing in the filmmaking process as far as overstepping, you know, your bounds, trying to use shots that are way more technical than you could possibly achieve. And also in the screenwriting process, you're probably writing scenes that are just too grand, too big for your budget and too big for your skill level, you know, as an independent filmmaker. Keep it simple, understand the editing mindset, and you'll have a much easier time getting everything uploaded uh, and sent off to distribution. Yeah, and, you know, really, it's not that we're trying to dissuade people from, you know, having grand ideas and, like, wanting to create their stories, because, again, there's always a balance. It's a business. It's an art. There's a lot of different dynamics to it. But the biggest thing, you know, that we stress is having more reps. The more reps you do, the better you get. The the Every time you learn from it, the more importantly, you learn from your mistakes. So we're simply trying to say, if you want the most successes, you know, you want to give yourself the most opportunities at bat. You want to see if you can step up as consistently as possible. And really for us in the DBS films process is, you know, we're searching for what that, you know, uh, that package, that product, that process is that we can develop and grow from. And I think our editor mindset, you know, obviously we learn from every single film that we made, but really making the conscious decision to consistently think back with that editor's mindset from the very beginning of the movie to where we are now made it just something where, you know, we finally had what that, that process is looking like and we can scale on moving forward. And, you know, with that being said, when you're in the editor's chair and you have this mindset, wow, it's so much better. You know, can we quickly talk about the difference in just editing when it feels creative versus when it feels like you are literally just trying to scrap together something because it becomes a frustrating problem to a blank canvas really quickly with just the footage you have. Yeah. So I think the issues that we had with the other eight films and why they took so long is you you're editing and you're feeling good. You're in a good, good flow. Everything's going well. And then you hit a problem. And so you have to slow down to fix the problem, whether this is a technical problem as far as like sound or the shots aren't good, or, you know, there's just something wrong with the takes that you have or the footage that you have that slows the whole process down because you have to put on like a problem solving uh, hat essentially. And when that, happens it takes a lot of creative juices to you know get through it you have to really think critically and figure out how you're going to solve this problem and it's frustrating and it slows down and then you can get to the point which we suffered from with a lot of a uh, with our first eight movies especially the morgan stay and the devil in the room was there's no solution to the problem and you have to do pickups and at that point you gotta just move on to the next scene but there's that black void in your timeline and you just don't feel good you lose all your momentum now we never had that in cabin 13 um we had to shoot the climax about 20 days later but we always knew that going into that we had to pick that up um there were some takes that were very risky we were down to the last one or two takes because there was some kind of issues with the other ones but for the most part we were able to manipulate that timeline and really like give it the proper pacing and the, the proper care it deserved to tell the story that I wanted to tell, which is why the feedback we got was, hey, I didn't realize that movie was an hour 20, which is the best feedback as an independent filmmaker. If someone says, I didn't realize your movie was an hour and 20 minutes long, is the best feedback you possibly get. Because you give it to the distribution companies, all they care about is pacing. They're getting paid by AVOD right now. So they want people to start that movie and finish that movie. So if you're getting that feedback, that is the feedback you're looking for. And the feedback that I look for when I show it to new people is, where does this movie slow down? Like, what are the, where, where's the slowdown points on this movie? Because I'm trying to eliminate them. If you can eliminate all slowdown points, you're in good shape. So I think Girl in Cabin 13 you really saw us be able to manipulate that movie like we wanted to. Um, and there were, I could have got more coverage or I got better coverage. There was some stuff in there that, you know, me as a DP uh, kind of messed up a little bit. But then we look at, I learned from that. 
and I made the murder house and we had, this is the murder house is the first movie. Where I'm like, all right, I could really control the pace of this movie. I could really tell the story I wanted to do through editing. Um, and that's just the process of learning of having the editor's mindset and going through this three or four times. Like Kel said, you want to have as many at bats as possible, where if this is just one movie, there's just no way you can absorb all the information possible to make it as good as possible where I really think there's probably, I don't know who said it, but someone uh, was saying that every director has eight bad movies in them and your goals are trying to get eight of them out, you know, just get those movies done with and learn from those movies as quickly as possible. And I think that a lot of filmmakers, especially independent filmmakers never get to the eight movie level. Um, and I'm on 11 and I still think I have a lot of problems and issues to, to resolve. So it's just, you know, the mindset of trying to get as many at-bats and to try and get as many swings as you possibly can, because these movies are lottery tickets. You never know who's going to see your movie. All it takes is one producer, one agent, one distribution company to see these this movie and be like, all right, look, we like your movie. It may not be the best, but we're willing to give you capital to make it better, or we're willing to just take it and send it off. And it just takes one good movie to spring, spring your career to essentially the next level. You know, now to just kind of jump in and highlight what the editing process looks like. I think one of the bigger things that we stress is having someone at least on site editing simply so you can ensure that you have the coverage. Cause we did have a few things where it's like, Hey, we need a shot here. We had a shot there, which allow you to, you know, right away solve the problem versus trying to fix it in post. But then you also kind of get, you know, a feel for the story and where you're going. It can be pretty much something that helps you move along in the process. And then when you are done, you know, we're done filming and essentially one, two, three more days of work. And we have that first outline. I mean, we already have the first outline for the shapeshifter. Again, this is really just the big skeleton of the system. But do you want to talk about how having that skeleton ready, you know, right away? Sometimes I feel like people take a while to even get into post, but we basically hit the ground running on all of our post productions and just really try and speed through that basic structure. You know, I, th I feel like we, we quickly get to that picture lock. So do you kind of want to explain the process from you know, we're done what you pretty much already have in your lap and then where we go from there. Yeah. I mean, having the, like a finished timeline is absolutely huge. Even if it's just wides or there's a lot of issues with the timeline, being able to sit down and look at this timeline, my editor hat once again, starts to try and figure out and, you know, critically think on how to make this movie better. To give you an example, I watched the shapeshifter over the weekend and just by watching the rough that Kel put together, I'm already trying to figure out are is like, all right, this is this scene is too quick. This scene is, you know, too slow. Where can I, you know, try and fix this thing up? And just having that thought process in the back of my head, even though I'm just I'm still working on the murder house, just allows me to go back in there because I'll have a general understanding or at least a game plan of what I'm trying to accomplish when I go and actually sit down, and try and edit this thing. So I think it's huge. And I think a huge indie mistake is that they get this timeline on, they're trying to edit it together and they're trying to make it perfect. They're trying to, you know, from the start of the movie all the way to the end, they're slowly trying to make it perfect. So they're like, all right, the first opening scene needs to be perfect before I move on. And that's going to frustrate you. It's going to overwhelm you. And it's just not a good process. So, and once again, this is a process that works for me. It might not be the best process for you, but here's what I do. We get a rough timeline. I go through it. I do my edit and I go all the way from start to finish, fixing things that I see. I take that edit. I watch it. I make notes and I go through it again. And I go through it again and again and again. And I'll go through it probably 20 times. Um, and obviously there's different stages, which is picture lock, then sound, then color, then I add movement via um, like keyframes. But for the most part, doing that keeps your momentum going. If I get to a part where I don't know how to do it or it's too technical, I just skip it and move on. And I'll just keep going until all the small stuff is done. And then I start tackling the bigger stuff where at least I need feedback from other people to figure this stuff out. 
Um, to give you a good example, in the murder house, there's a lock-in sequence that I just had no idea how to do. Got a lot of feedback, and I've been constantly hammering that, hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, and I finally got to a place where I think it's actually pretty decent. But if you're stopping or trying to make your timeline perfect, it's the same as writing a screenplay. You're better off just writing it from start to finish and then going through it over and over and over again than trying to make the perfect script. Because number one, you don't know if the perfect script exists. And also you're going to just frustrate yourself with your lack of progress because when you get to these scenes or you get to this, um, you know, when you're writing, you get to a part where you just don't know how to do it or you get writer's block, you're going to quit and you're going to get frustrated. If you just skip it and keep going and just understand that you're going to have to go to make a final product, a final edit, you're going to have to do it 25 to 30 times going from start to finish. If that's your mindset, which is my mindset, it's just much easier to keep momentum because if you get to a point where you're stuck, you skip it and move on. And then eventually the only parts of your movie that you're stuck on are the really hard stuff and you have to sit down and really fix them. But you, knowing that the rest of your movie is essentially picture locked is a good feeling. And that's essentially where we are with the murder house right now, where I've handled all the small stuff. There's a couple of hard, very difficult scenes that, in there that I'm just need a little bit more feedback from other people on. But for the most part, this movie is essentially completed. Yeah, no, I, I think really it comes down to being able to basically give it a pass. You know, we always see it as like making a statue carving it out of marble. You know, you're basically just chipping away the first rough cut. You know, like you said, it's usually just a bunch of wides and everything put together. And then from there, what we do is we just make those cycles through it and kind of just pass back and forth. You know, this is this scene. This is this one. This is this. What would you do here? What would you do there? And passing those things back and forth while, you know, cleaning through them gets to that picture lock. Um, and then from there, you know, it's really kind of those final details. So seeing how many indie productions just get caught up in this process when it really is the toughest to some degree as well, too. You know, it's, it's not a surprise to me. It's not a surprise that this is really where a lot of indie films, you know, find their final fate, unfortunately, lost to the void because you do have to put in the hours you have to put in the time but you know having the editor's mindset makes that hours way less makes that time way more enjoyable and you know it becomes a process where you know personally i enjoy editing you know i find enjoy in editing our movies now you know for the most part i would say is enjoyable i think having more hours in the day to devote to editing and not having to do it on top of a bunch of other stuff you know, those are kind of the things where it still can get a lot of a bit grueling and grinding, but you know, it's, it's great because from an editor's standpoint, that's when you see that picture come together, you know, you see it finally uh, lock in and, you know, take shape. So that's really part of the process that I enjoy a ton when it comes to, um, you know, editing. Um, I think though, you know, one of the biggest things that was coming out of this was almost that proof of concept as well to, uh, as well too because you know I think going into the girl in cabin 13 as we kind of mentioned the past two episodes we were just nervous about this because you know if we didn't have a movie for whatever reason then it kind of you know would really put us back because I would say we made a big overhaul in the decisions of how we were going to run it simple and straightforward and what we we're going to do in the sense of keeping the budget as low as we could to get to the final product. So, you know, do you want to talk about how once you get through the editing process, not only does it give you that motivation to continue to film make and continue to work versus, you know, having a block and not being able to do it, but in our case, it really helped making the, you know, next steps a lot more clear. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, editing is interesting because, you know, the first cut or essentially the first big milestone of the timeline is getting the movie on the timeline and then having it flow even at the worst possible you know way it could possibly flow which is just wides or you know there's something wrong with the footage you could just fall back on some some shots so at least you can just get a movie done so it may not be the movie that you want but if you have to fall back on wives or other shots to get this done or pickups, getting it completed and knowing that you have visually, you have a movie that can be uploaded. And I think it's very weird because I'm going through this whole process and like, I'm like, all right, I got this scene done. Please, you know, don't let there be a problem with the next scene. And you're kind of going through it and you're like, Oh, thank God I got through this scene. Like it's all good. You can move it to the next thing. So visually, the first step is just get something visually done. And 
you know, where we are right now, I think that's pretty easy because obviously Kel's on set and he's making sure that there's, you know, we have continuity with editing all the way through. So there's usually a pretty good, uh, we usually leave our set with a good picture lock. The one that's really scary is when I'm going and doing sound because sound is very, very difficult to detect um, issues when, you know, I'm essentially the sound person because we use lav mics. And Kel is using two channels when he's watching these things because we have one actor in the left channel, one actor in the right channel. So it's essentially me just freaking out going through each scene, being like, is there anything wrong with this audio? Is there anything wrong with this take? You know, can we get through it? And I have to start to compromise because there could be some rustling or the mic could fall off and I have to use another take, which I didn't want to use because I have the, the picture lock from the visual aspect of the movie. So going through sound wise is a very, very stressful thing. It's probably the most stressful part of editing. Um, but as you go through it, you know, and you get it done, you gain confidence um, because you can see things you're doing well and things you you can learn from and just not mistakes that you don't want to repeat again. Um, and just, you know, that the confidence of being able to edit this thing and get it all the way through and get it completed, like just looking at what I did with the murder house, that confidence led to a bigger ambitious script with the shapeshifter. And now seeing um, Kel's cut of the shapeshifter, it just gives you more confidence to start looking at other scripts that I didn't think we were, you know, that were possible at this time, which is like Drugs, Inc. We have an alternate timeline, um, like time travel script that we could probably do right now. Morgan Estates back on the table. There's a lot of stuff that we can do that's in the realm of shapeshifter. And it's just, it's like making sure you understand where you are on a technical level and understand you know where you are at a skill level and then kind of making the jumps and moving from there yeah and again that's why it just pays off to have the editor's mindset you know being able to say hey listen you know let's move forward when it comes to the project because as i'm going through this i'm seeing it's you know easy to make and thus we can level up essentially in our filmmaking which is you know essentially us leveling up when it comes to the writing in the story that we decide on. So, you know, as you mentioned, it, it really is something where getting through these entire processes and just kind of confirming, it gives you that confidence boost. It lets you progress as a, a filmmaker. Um, you know, in my opinion, how are you starting to feel, you know, about the girl in cabinet 13 at this point in time? I'm trying to remember, you know, I think what's going to be nice with these podcasts and everything is we're going to actually be able to, you know, remember more so exactly how we feel. Cause you know, one thing I was already saying is we typically go on a scale. Um, I would say you more so too, just in the beginning where, you know, as you watch it, you're like, okay, this is good. But then as you start to really clean it up, you're like, wow, this actually is really good. Um, you know, it, it kind of almost improves and you, you know, go from it being rough to it being cleaner. When were you kind of feeling that, okay, you know, this is definitely a big milestone, a big jump for us. Cause you know, I, I think we saw it in the screenwriting process in the sense of, you know, just how the movie would flow and you know, how simple it was for us to film. We saw it in the actual production being on time and everything. When in the post-production process did you kind of understand, you know, okay, this is, this is a big step up, you know, let's, let's push forward through it. Yeah, I think when we, we finished the climax, um, so we shot the climax about two or three weeks after principal shooting was completed, but by that time we had like a full cut of the movie. Um, and I got the climax in there and I was very happy with the climax. I thought there's probably some of the best 15 minutes we've ever shot. We shot it all in one night. Everyone did a great job on this, um, you know, to, fin to finalize the climax. And I think... You know, it kind of ebbs and flows. There are days where I'm like, this is really good. There's days where I'm like, I could have done a lot better. Um, but it wasn't until we really started to get the music going um, that I started to see like, all right, this is a really well-paced movie. And it really wasn't until I got the first round of feedback where people are like, this movie's really well-paced. And obviously they had problems with, 
you know, a lot of story in there, which is fine. But the one thing for the first time in our history, they're like, this is a well-paced movie. I watched it all the way through. It seemed like it was a 30 minute episode. Um, so I was really happy with that feedback. And a lot of the feedback was on story, which I was super excited about because we usually don't get a lot of feedback on story. Um, and just a lot of ways that I can improve the story, which is like the feedback that I want. It's like, is Girl in Cabin 13 my magnus opus? No. Am I not going to shoot any other movies in Cabin 13? No. So it's like, I can learn from this. I can make 2.0 version of this movie. I can make a 3.0 version of this movie. I can make a 4.0 version of this movie. I just need to have good feedback in order to make it better. So to get that feedback that, and it wasn't just technical related feedback as far as like, all right, your shots are not very good and your sound is not very good. It was just very beneficial. And so I was more, and I'm always super excited for feedback. That is like literally the most valuable thing you can possibly provide me is good, solid feedback, not only on what you like and what you don't like, but if you don't like something, how you can fix it, how I can make it better. Um, and we got a ton of that right off the bat with the Girl in Cabin 13 Rough Cuts. So I was super excited about that. And that's just where I need to go. I need to make a movie good enough to get feedback on it so that I can improve the story. And I could just make a better movie because I think a lot of indie filmmakers never get to that point because their movie suffers from a lot of technical issues. So they don't get a lot of feedback on the story, which is how you become a better filmmaker, is how you become a better screenwriter, is how you become a better DP, is how you become a better editor, is story-based feedback. So to get that um, right away, which is a milestone in DBS history, it was super beneficial to me. I was super proud of that. And then anything on top of that, as far as like monetary wise or how we got to a distribution company was just a cherry on top. Yeah, no, I, I really do agree that basically being able to have that solidified that, you know, this is the, the bare bones product that we can consistently create because if you can create pacing, you can just layer on the story. You know, pacing is basically that vehicle. It's that base that you're going to get from point A to point B. And as long as you can do that, you're really going to have success when it comes to just playing around with the different story elements. So I think you bring up a really, really good point and something that I kind of want to start highlighting right now. You mentioned, you know, feedback is critical. And I think more so than anything, since, you know, we've developed the Discord and the super fans, we have such fantastic feedback. Like, completely next level from even what we were getting back for the uh, girl in cabin 13. But we always knew that feedback was critical when it comes to just improving in the process there. What I want to highlight though, is just kind of, you know, understanding feedback in the sense of it's going to be your friends and family. So another benefit with uh, having more reps is, you know, you can at least get a baseline of your friends and family, but then when should you show someone the movie? Because I think almost like a little, a very sharp dagger that can be hit in any filmmaker is if they show a movie a little bit too soon and they get a little bit of feedback, not understanding, you know, what a finished product looks like versus a rough, how that can kind of slow you down. Yeah, I think it's a definite balance and it's, it's very tricky. It took, once again, it's like a learning experience on when to show people your movie to get good feedback. If you show it too early, they're going to focus on the technical issues and they're going to focus on a lot of things that just don't really matter. And if you show it too late, you're not going to actually, you're going to have to take that feedback and go back and do a lot of work to fix up a lot of stuff. So usually what I do now is I try and get as close to picture lock as I possibly can. And I try and clean up sound. So I balance it the best that I can on like a quick pass through. So I'm not putting a lot of time on there. But I'm trying to make it so that people can just understand what people, the, the dialogue that characters are saying. And then I try and put placeholder music over it. Just so, because music is huge, especially for horror movies on just getting pacing. So people, we were getting feedback. If you don't have music in a scene, people are going to say it's boring, it's slow. You add some creepy music in there and all of a sudden you got tension, you got mood. And it's, it's really wild how important music is to a horror movie. But I'm trying to get just basic picture lock, balance the sound so it's not blowing anyone's speakers, and then just get a basic um, music on there. And then I'll put like a, a, a basic grade. Now I work with the custom LUT that I've designed, so I just kind of throw that on there. 
It's not going to look the greatest, but it's getting like the darkness and the tension, the mood that I'm looking for. And then I get feedback from that. Now, this is coming from almost eight movies, nine movies of experience. I showed movies to a lot of people because I was excited about it with no music and bad sound and bad uh, audio. And the feedback they gave me was just not useful. And I've showed people movies that are pretty much completed and they started to notice things that I've completely missed. I've had to go back and re-edit the whole movie. So it's a fine line. Um, the best I, advice I could give you is just make a lot of movies and try out different techniques. Um, but there is a difference between, between showing your movie to family and friends versus other people, maybe not as close friends or a community um, and we're extremely lucky to have Discord community because the feedback they gave me on the murder house was ex like exceptional. And the movie is much, much better due to the feedback. So obviously a lot of people aren't going to have that opportunity to have a Discord community and a super fan community like we do. Um, I would try and say it, show it to friends of friends, if at all possible, or people who are just not as close to you and try and gauge their feedback and see what they have to say. I think the, you know, music element is really critical for it. Like you were saying, you know, that, that really is kind of night and day. And I mean, I've even had experiences with myself where I'll be like, the sound's not ready or the color's not ready. And then, you know, they mentioned the sounds off and the colors off. And I think it's just natural because, you know, if the sound is off, it really is a subconscious element that kind of messes with you. And then if the color's off, those are both things that just, you know, take out of the experience of being locked into the movie. So I would really, again, try and get to those levels in the sense of, you know, as best as you can, even if it's placeholder music, I think placeholder music before you send it off would be great just to really, again, you know, enhance the elements you're giving it just so they can stay focused on the story. Cause again, that's the biggest thing that we're looking for. How can we change the story? What's hitting, what's not, what needs to be increased, what's not working, what is working. All of those things are very critical. And if they can't get past the sound elements or if they get caught up in some of the visuals, you know, it really, you know, affects them in that sense. So getting the feedback and having everything, you know, ready to go, I think to me, one of the, the best parts about it again was, you know, I almost kind of knock on wood, but I feel like it's one of those things where the girl in cabin 13 showed us really that basic understanding and from the editor's mindset that this is the rough template for a movie. You know, these are the things that you can end up doing. And eventually, you know, maybe we might try something too bold. You know, again, I don't want to ever jinx any of our, any of our productions, but because of, you know, the confirmation from editing through the girl in cabin 13, in the sense of this is a movie, this was clean. This is the structure that we have. You know, I don't see us finding ourselves in a predicament where essentially the movie's in, you know, life support. It's in a critical state of, it needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of attention. And I mean, just compare this, the amount of time we spent editing, you know, the haunting of the, the Whitlow or the Morgan estate, how many times over we could edit the girl in cabin 13 and just that confirming that process that we can get it down to a much more manner, manageable post-production, what that means moving forward in the sense of doing more. Yeah. I mean, it was just our story. It was the first time we told a story that we wanted to tell and we got it uploaded. And we did it in three months time. That was, we finished shooting in May. We had a pickup in the middle of June, but that thing was sent off or sent to market August 1st. So to be able to do that is just a milestone to be able to tell a story and do it in an efficient manner and do it under budget is just, it's a milestone. And it just comes down to, I think the biggest issue with independent filmmakers is they have this idea in their head and to be able to communicate that idea to a DP, to a screenwriter, to an editor is very, very, very difficult. And unless you're, unless you have a lot of reps behind you, or if you have a bigger budget, because obviously a bigger budget makes your life a lot easier if you're working on a micro budget, that's going to be your biggest problem is how do you get that idea in your head shot and uploaded? And a lot of it's just going to be a lot of the ideas that you have are just not feasible. 
but it's also just communication style and communicating with all these people that are doing tasks that you might not have the best idea of how to actually accomplish them. And I think the filmmakers, when they actually see the edits that they've, um, you know, of their final product, it's so far off from their, their final vision of what they thought it was going into their head that they, they, they get frustrated. And it's just a very difficult and humbling process to get through. And it's taken me eight movies to figure out how to do this. But for the first time, Girl in Cabin 13 is the movie that I had in my head. Is it a perfect movie? No. But this is the movie that I thought up and I made and I edited and I uploaded. And now I can get feedback on that. So the next time when I'm writing a movie or I'm visualizing in my head, I could take the feedback from the thousands of reviews that we've gotten from the bloggers, from the super fans, from IMDb, from Amazon, from all the sites that we've gotten. I compile that feedback and I look at what people like and I try and move towards that and I see what people don't like. And I just won't repeat those same mistakes and getting to this point of being able to take a story from your head and actually upload it and get it, you know, on a, a visual medium up to distribution companies that they can actually upload and then getting a mass amount of feedback is just so beneficial. It's going to make me such a better filmmaker. And I just think I see all these indie filmmakers with, you know, they see they have like six or seven reviews and yeah, they're five stars, but they're five stars from friends and family. You really want the most valuable feedback is just get beat down. You really want to upload your, your movie and just get it absolutely decimated because the one stars are more valuable than the five stars because they'll tell you exactly what you need to fix and how to fix it. And you can learn from those. Embrace the suck. I mean, honestly, that's basically what you got to do with anything, you know, look at any kind of, you know, professional level degree when it comes to learning something, you got to go through practices, you got to go through reps. And the thing that's different with, you know, movies and any other median is as soon as you release the movie, you're immediately playing against the pros. You're playing up against every single Hollywood movie out there. They don't know the difference that you're just getting started. You know, they don't understand that you're just the first time filmmaker with this, with literally, you know, one one thousandth of a budget compared to what they have. But with that being said, what they do hone in on shows you the areas that you can improve. You know, we always say it's always about making your movie appear to be in those same leagues, even if you have those restrictions and those limits. And with that being said, you know, I feel like Girl in Cabin 13 really kind of hits a, a, a very good milestone when it comes to fulfilling that model. So, you know, last thing I really want to touch on again, I think one thing we were always pretty confident with is the idea that this movie's likely going to sell. I mean, it had a lot of the thematics where it comes to cabins in the woods, horror, you know, we really were approaching this one from, hey, this is a confident market I think we can go after. Again, we split test it and we split tested the name and everything. But do you want to kind of talk about going into Growing Cabin 13 when it came to narrowing it down on the, the trailer, the cover and the title? Because, again, those are the three most important things you need as a movie, more so than the actual movie. Yeah, I mean, we split test the title and the cover pretty extensively. Um, so I felt good with both of them. Um, they're very, they're both very high converting. I was very confident with the concept. Um, Strangers, Hush, um, a lot of like Cabin in the Woods type movies do very, very well. It's a horror trope. Um, the Mass Killers horror trope. People who understand horror, especially indie horror, and understand that stuff like these kind of movies. So I, I knew there was an audience in there. And then trailers, we're very good at making trailers. Um, so I knew we'd make something that was very good. I think we ended up making 10 to 15 different trailers for this movie. And we were getting like penny clicks. The, the social media trailer where Sonny Hole and the cell phone did very, very well. So having, understanding that the movie that you're making um, is very popular, the tropes are very popular, the cover is the best cover that you could possibly design. We had maybe four or 500 different variations of the cover. We uh, settled on the floating cabin, which is super popular. 
added some blood on there for good measure. Then we had the title. It's ambiguous. It's unique. It, you can remember it. And then the blurb is just, you know, it's, we spent, I probably wrote five or 600 blurbs for this one. Settled on one that's Occam's Razor. It, you know, it, it tells you exactly what it is. It's a horror movie. There's bad things going to happen to this girl. It kind of pressures on the stalking and social media aspect um, that's relevant, that hits home, that's a, a primal fear of a lot of people, especially if you're going out to, you know, remote Airbnb or cabin in the middle of the woods. So I, I was very confident this one's going to do very well. Um, but I was actually very surprised at how well it actually did. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's always something you never quite know. So you want to give yourself as much, you know, opportunity as possible. But I think the concept of being out in the woods is a very textbook horror trope. The idea of being trapped on the inside, you know, look at how many movies there are where you're basically siege mentality, where you're trapped and the, the bad guys are out there. So we really combine a lot of those basic elements in a basic and simple movie and getting from start to finish. You know, it was really, really simple. It was a serious process. And we basically got to the point where we were able to execute on that idea. So when we were getting done with the movie in post-production, um, you know, we were already kind of winding up on the haunting of the murder house. But I think one of the bigger things I want to talk about is you know, the fact that we had everything going, we had the marketing ready, we're ready for a launch and there's no real issues. Getting through a smooth post-production just allows you to forecast so much better. When you can get a movie to a point where you can just sit down and finish it versus working on other timelines and schedules, it then allows you to set hard deadlines. And basically we were able to say pretty quickly in this post-production process, all right, green light, let's move on to the murder house. So you kind of want to talk about how that helps you just as a filmmaker, you know, improve how much you're progressing because you can now forecast if you don't have these issues in post-production. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to, I think the biggest mistake that I made before was just, you know, we were shooting too much without having finished uploaded products. And so we were making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. So I think what, um, you know, being able to finish this thing, you know, and upload it and understand, you know, all right, this is what we did well, this is what we didn't do well. I felt much more confident green lighting another product or project. I could start working on another project because I knew I learned as much as I possibly could with this movie. And we have the murder house still in uh, post-production, but it's about to be completed. And we have, you know, we just shot another movie. And you're like, well, Brendan, why are you telling me to, you know, finish a movie before I shoot another movie? Because the murder house is pretty much completed and it just needs a few technical polishing up, um, you know, things to get to where it needs to go. But I got feedback on it before I started Shapeshifter. I understood what we did well and what we didn't do well. And, you know, there was no doubt in my mind that the murder house would ever become, it would never not be a movie. I think that's a big thing. You can move on to the next project or you start, you know, coordinating and pre-planning the next project, but just make sure the current project that you have right now is completely 100% sure to be uploaded. And that's where we were at the murder house. There's just a few small technical details um, that need to be fixed up. I got a ton of feedback from the super fans. I knew I needed to fix up. So I was like, all right, I, I've learned as much as I possibly can from this project, which I think is what you need to be, which needs to be your goal. You can move on to the next project when you're 100% sure that you've learned all you need to do from this last project. I know I did well. I know what I you know, messed up and I've learned from that. And when I'm like, there is nothing left for me to do in this project. I've learned everything I need to do. I've learned my lessons. I'm ready to move on. And that's what you need to do. For the first eight movies, I wasn't doing that. We had multiple projects up in the air. I wasn't learning my lessons and it caused me to just repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again, which cost me time. It cost me money and it was just a lot of frustration. So it's, it's fine to move on and start pre-planning the next project. Cause obviously you want to have a rapid release cycle, but just make sure that you've squeezed every last like bit of learning juice out of that sponge um, in order to just move on to the next project. I mean, yeah, I completely agree. And I think one 
precaution I do want to issue any filmmakers listening to this, you know, this is our ninth movie that we feel confident in moving on. In, and we completely admit that we made the mistakes of moving on too quickly in the past ones. I think you could literally take the first eight movies we made and condense it down to maybe three. If we had done the process from the very beginning to the very end. Now, maybe we wouldn't have as much idea on like marketing and uploading and those things. But when it comes down to solid tactics, when it comes to just executing and, and planning, all of these things could have vastly been advanced had we gone through that upload process because you just don't know until the end. So, you know, overall, it really was a big milestone for us. We do have one more episode on The Girl in Cabin 13 where we really want to highlight two things. One is, you know, it was our first time going through the distribution route. So we do want to shine some light on just what that looks like. I actually want to talk about, you know, distributors get kind of a bad rep to some degree um, in the sense of, you know, we hear a lot from the filmmaker side. You don't hear a lot from the distributor side to kind of counter it. But we just want to highlight the business model that it is and how you can navigate it as an indie filmmaker. So, you know, we're going to highlight some of that in our next episode. And we're also going to talk about what it's like to start building a community, especially when you start having, you know, consistent projects and consistent releases. So as always, be sure to take a look at us online, you know, join our Discord community. That's going to be the best place to find us. We also have the Girl in Cabin 13 online for free on Tubi. So be sure to check that out. Uh, but we look forward to, you know, chatting with you again. So until then, have a good one.